Movie tie-in games are almost never good. From Spider-Man 3 and E.T. And good tie-in games like Shrek Super Slam and the Lego tie-in games like Jurassic World and The Hobbit. But then there's a quadrilogy of tie-in games that have formed a consistency that can only be described as interesting. You see, for each of the live-action films up till Age of Extinction, each of the Transformers films had a tie-in. Transformers 1's tie-in was interesting. Revenge of the Fallen's was pretty mid, while Transformers Rise of the Dark Spark was able to kill off the Transformers 1 and 4 for Cybertron games. Each of the tie-ins were released on different platforms like Xbox 360, PS3 and DS, with the DS ports being the best version and 1-2 having an actual unique plot which still ties in to the story. Now each of the first two games had two campaigns, the Decepticon campaign and the Autobot campaign, something the DS port would capitalise on by making you pay for either. This was last seen in Transformers War for Cybertron, but unlike its previous games in the franchise, the separate campaigns are important to the story with the Decepticon campaign taking place before the Autobot campaign, instead of being the same story with different coats of paint. The first game to change this would be the third tie-in movie game developed by High Moon Studios, Transformers Dark of the Moon, which would build up upon that what War for Cybertron made and acted as a bridge between War and Fall of Cybertron. With Fall of Cybertron opting and adopting Dark of the Moon's game structure, with the first half taking place in the Autobot campaign, with the second half being Decepticon. There was a multiplayer for the game, but... The game is set between the second and the third film, which sets up the film's story, and showing us how Soundwave got his vehicle form, and how Shockwave appears out of literally nowhere, which he still does in the game. The game also shows us how Megatron ends up as a truck in Africa, which is the most important plotline of the series. And believe it or not, this game is kinda good. But don't get me wrong, the game still sucks ass. But, in a good way. It's easily the best of the tie-in games if you don't count the DS games because they are better than any part of the console games. The gameplay is the same as well for Cybertron, with only the only difference being that you can't pick up guns and end up ramming into enemies in vehicle form that sends them at Mach 3 into the atmosphere. <laughs> Not to mention the driving feels a bit janky and feels like it needs a few more hours in the oven. The game starts off in orbit, and we get a speech from Optimus as he tells us about the starts of the war between the Autobots and Decepticons. Then we are shown that Soundwave is still attached to the satellite he hooked up to in the last movie. Coming back to Earth, Bumblebee jumps from a plane into an abandoned USSR town. Optimus thinks that Decepticons are monitoring the Autobots' transmissions with Nest, which they are. So Bumblebee and Sideswipe and Optimus have been deployed into the local area to find the Decepticons from communication station to upload a virus that Real Jack made to stop the Decepticons. Moving through the town, Optimus tells us to use our Stealth Force tech, another word for the gameplay from War for Cybertron. In Stealth Force mode, Transformers have stronger weapons and stronger armour. Bumblebee picks up a signal from a far off satellite station. Entering normal vehicle mode, Bumblebee drives off towards the outpost, with Optimus and Nest talking about how the towns are abandoned, and even though we, they haven't found any Decepticons, Optimus warns them the area is perfect for the Decepticon base. Keep your guard up. Each of them would serve as a perfect Decepticon hideout. As Bumblebee travels through the valley, he's warned that three Decepticon energy signatures have been detected and they are moving fast towards the tower. Optimus instructs Bumblebee to race towards the tower as a timer appears at the top of the screen. Racing through the valley, Bumblebee comes across multiple abandoned structures such as gates and bridges. In Arriving at the tower in time, Bumblebee moves inside and finds the Decepticon comms station and uploads the virus. Optimus tells Bumblebee to get out there as fast as possible before the comms arrive, which isn't possible as the comms have already arrived. There are three Decepticons and two of them stay behind to fight Bumblebee as one flees, so we can go to our Megatron. And this is our first combat section of the game. Each of the characters has only two weapons, a main gun that's part of them, with exceptions being Optimus who never used the built-in weapon during the films ever, or rather using handheld weaponry. The Transformers also have a secondary weapon, which is a handheld. This isn't Cybertron. The two factions don't have access to new Cybertron in weaponry that they can just build into them. Instead, the Autobots use mech tech, which is a mix between human and Cybertronian technology, which explains why the weapons are handheld. While the primary weapon is the Cybertronian weaponry they still have that's built into them, such as Ironhide's cannons and Bumblebee's cannon. There are other weapons available, like melee weapons and ab abilities such as Heavy Iron 1 and Heavy Iron 2 and Starscream's missiles. Engaging the Decepticons, we easily take them down, and once the gates have dropped, we must chase down the Decepticon that's trying to get away. Now remember all the abandoned structures we went past? Now remember all those abandoned structures that we passed? Now all the Decepticons of the area have come out to play, so we can attack. 
They've taken over the area and are using structures as cover. Optimus tells B that he must take out all the cons, so B leads them all to the abandoned town and waits for Optimus and Sideswap to arrive. But in the meantime, he must take out all the mini comm stations in the tower that weren't there before. So in the span of us leaving and coming back, about 5,000 Decepticons showed up and took over the town. And the Autobots only detected three, but never mind that. Moving through the village, B deals with the transmitters and in doing so, sent some cons into orbit. Once all the Decepticons have been dealt with, Optimus and Sideswipe finally arrive and we can bring our Holy Divinity down to the Decepticons. And after a while of shooting and dealing with air support, Optimus declares a mission a success. With the case of a small part of genocide over, Optimus tells us that he's got intel from the station. That has allowed them to hunt down Decepticons and eliminate them all over the world. Wow, what a good idea. I sure hope this doesn't get turned against them. <laughs> Wrong with you humans. Major Reynolds chimes in, and the humans in this game are live action video, which is a big improvement over the last games. Or cells to reautomate his mainframe. Just in time. But the Autobots, on the other hand, are not an improvement. I need you to provide assistance with the evacuation efforts. Ironhide. Here, Prime. Locate and neutralize the Decepticon threat. On it. The humans didn't ask for this war. Reynolds tells us Detroit has turned into a war zone, which is nothing new. And that the Decepticons have taken over the area, this concept would later be used and stolen by Detroit Become Human. 28 samples! Optimus sends Ratchet and Ironhide in to deal with the issue. Ratchet to coordinate search and rescue and evacuation, and Ironhide is to well. Ironhide, this is Ratchet. What's your status? Just mopping up the streets of Detroit. One Decepticon at a time. Well, to Echo Optimus, please try to re Arriving at the gate into the city, we meet a little continuity detail. Ironhide has his cannons, which he lost in Revenge of the Fallen. But here he has them, and we see in Dark of the Moon he hasn't got them. This detail cannot be forgiven by High Moon Studios, but if you pay me at least 66 grand, I could let this slide. Moving into the city, Ratchet tells Ironhide that he's about done with the evacuation and only has two more convoys to escort. So while Ratchet does that, Ironhide moves into the city and after a while of wandering around, walks into an ambush, which goes well. Your heavy iron rifle is perfect for cutting apart through crowded areas. Thanks for the tip, Jack. After causing some more damage to the city, which gets us a telling off by Optimus, Ratchet radios in and tells Ironhide he's wrapped up the evacuation but has detected a large amount of energy signatures inside a steel mill. So Ironhide begins to move to Ratchet's location so he can be back up. Moving ahead and after my dad tells me that I've had the Xbox's quality set to 480p and not 1080, I continue ahead in crisp quality, so now you won't have to wear glasses after watching this video. Moving to the entrance of the steel mill, there's no sign of Ratchet, but luckily for me, he radios in only to tell me he's been outnumbered and Mixmaster has just shown up. So after getting a move on, I find Mixmaster going down hard on Ratchet. So to save him, I step in and drop the floor under him, which was the only option as my weapons did not affect him due to his armour. So once Mixmaster has been successfully Batista bombed, Ratchet tells Ironhide that he needs time to repair his systems. The only issue is half the Decepticon army is about to show up. So after a while of defending Ratchet, he finally joins in and Ironhide and him fight through the steel mill and hunt down Mixmaster. Small issue however, Mixmaster's shield protects him from my attacks, so Wheeljack airdrops us a weapon that can deal with it. The accurately named Heavy Iron 2, which instead of being a machine gun, like Heavy Iron 1, is instead a rocket launcher of death. Ironhide tells Ratchet that he'll deal with Mixmaster by himself, and after a while of searching, Mixmaster shows Mishmaster. English, it's, it's simple words. Mixmaster shows up and the battle begins. Using the new weaponry and Ironhide has acquired, Mixmaster shields cannot stand against its power, and is quickly knocked down, and is safely dealt with in a very humane way. What's for Ratchet? And this is for me! Optimus, Mixmaster has been disposed of. With no war crimes committed, a transmission is established where we are told that Sideswipe has gone missing after being sent on a scouting mission to an old Mayan temple, and his last transmission is rather distressing. Optimus, I found a hidden Decepticon base. It looks like some kind of giant launching pad. I'm staying on the move. The con patrols are heavy, and I've only got so much time before they find me. Send back a fast. 
Optimus has deployed both Bumblebee and Mirage to find Sideswipe, and the two are set to rendezvous near his last known location. In this level, we play as Mirage, or Dino as he's called in the film, who is more hostile towards the humans. I love this level because it shows us that the Autobots aren't just robots, they do have their own opinions, they don't all just agree with Optimus, and not all of them are happy about being stuck on Earth and having to give up their time on Cybertron. An idea that would later be shown more in Fall for Cybertron with its audio logs. Characters like Jetfire and Drift show us that these Autobots can change sides and that they have their own thoughts, they are individuals and they do have their own faults and egos. Change. Driving along an abandoned mountain road, Mirage is met with the arrival of Starscream. Major Reynolds comes over the comm link and tells Mirage that Starscream has become a bombing route and that there is about and he's about to carpet bomb the entire mountain. Mirage needs to reach a nearby tunnel for cover, so he races there as quickly as possible. As Mirage grows closer to the tunnel, some of Starscream's missiles land and begin to blow up the road. The road itself has been abandoned for years and hasn't been privy to any repairs made, so what's left of the road is already undrivable, but Mirage pushes on and eventually reaches the tunnel. Once Starscream has finished his run, Mirage is met with the arrival of some Decepticon drones, and transforming out of vehicle mode, I find Mirage's main weapon is a sniper and his secondary is a submachine gun. Once the drones have been dealt with, Mirage reaches a bridge which leads to a small stint with Starscream and Mirage is dropped into the pits of hell. By hell I mean the game's stealth section. Due to the fall, Mirage has been damaged and his weapons have been lost. He isn't able to change form and he's that me and that means he isn't able to access his stealth force tech. Mirage has to use his cloak to move through the jungle and a lot of Decepticons and Mirage can't fight them because all they've got is guns. Mirage has to rely on his cloak to move through the jungle and fight Decepticons. However, Mirage cannot directly take on the cons because they've got guns and he's got wrist blades. Moving through the jungle, Mirage comes across a Mayan temple which has Decepticon hieroglyphs all over the walls. But these aren't just any Decepticon hieroglyphs, they're ancient Decepticon hieroglyphs and some of the cons guarding the site can't even translate them. And after some more jungle adventures, Mirage finds a Decepticon, but the Decepticon is bigger than the drones. It's more animalistic. That sends out a pulse, and once it connects with Mirage, will temporarily deactivate his cloak, which is embarrassing. And because High Moon Studios don't think that was hard enough, take 15 snipers at the same time. Oh, and what's this? You want your gun to defend yourself? Good luck with that. Sneak through four cons with cloak cracking abilities and 45 more snipers, and you can have your guns back. Once you get your guns back, however, this is where the fun stops. Once you have your guns, you are somehow magically repaired so you can change forms again. And moving ahead, we meet up with B, who pulls off some sick moves that Mirage makes fun of. Don't sound so surprised. That's what you get for showing off. And then it turns out we're near Sideswipe's last location, so we can continue the mission that everyone will have forgotten about. As you're faced with a rather shitty sniping sequence, which is completely optional as you can just head down there and fight one on one with the cons, the floor begins to sink. And here we get a mini boss, which after one quick Google search, I didn't find its name, but it's one of these goofy ass motherfuckers. Then, after an annoyingly long fight, a cell rises from what I can only assume is hell, and Sideswipe appears, and because Mirage isn't able to jump this very small jump, Thea, Mirage, and Sideswipe have to fend off the Decepticon attack while Major Reynolds calls in an airstrike. And after an eternity of fighting, the airstrike finally arrives, and as well as leveling the Decepticon... After an eternity of fighting, the air... After an eternity of fighting, the airstrike finally arrives, and it levels all the Decepticons to ash and bone and scrap. It also levels the stairs so Mirage can climb them. And Sideswipe says he'll stick back, so me and Bumblebee have saved him and he refuses to join in. The ungrateful bastard. So while Bumblebee takes the high ground and Mirage the low ground, which doesn't make sense seeing as Mirage is a sniper and B isn't. But you know what, I'm not a game designer, I know nothing about fighting. Fuck me. They, the two fight through the temple and we have an annoying section where Mirage has to stop Bumblebee from being sniped, which would only make more sense if B was on the lower ground, not the high ground. But you know, you just keep this moving. Then we come across a space shuttle launch. Turns out the entire Mayan temple is the Decepticon version of NASA. And guess who shows back up? That's right, Starscream. If you didn't guess Starscream, you'd be wrong and your punishment is hitting the subscribe button. 
Starscream's boss battle is pretty simple. He launches a flurry of rockets out of his chest cavity and flies around while the Decepticons attack. One thing I do like is that Starscream's abilities you see here, you could pull off when he plays it. But a boss battle must come to an end and thank god this one did. However, due to the fact that Mirage and Bumblebee were busy fighting Starscream, they weren't able to stop the launch in time and the rocket flies into orbit, into space going, only god could know where. Now it's time to turn this tale towards the Decepticons. Megatron opens a con with Sandwave and orders him to detach from the human satellite to go to a remote human island to cover up some files about the moon landing. Now, this is what writers would call world building children as we see the operation on the moon, which happens to be the plot of the third film in the series. And this is presumably where the spaceship is going. And on Soundwave's descent, he scans a car, which shows us two things. One, how he got to Earth in between the two films, and how he got his vehicular form. It's just a shame he's a totally different car in the films. At least he's the same colour. Landing on the island, Soundwave quickly arrives at an old radio station, which once hijacked, spouts some gibberish, but before we can make any sense of it, it's cut off due to a firewall. So another tower must be found, and continuing ahead, I found it. It is, however, surrounded by Autobots, which I quickly deal with. And after scanning the tower, the signal's cut off again. So after scanning more towers, Sandwave is able to locate the former Sector 7 base entrance. And after fighting through some lava, Sandwave comes across the door, which is locked. So he must deploy laser beak to find the data and destroy it. Moving inside, we're introduced to a pointless stealth mechanic, because most Autobots can be dealt with by either becoming a Beyblade or or being a literal ballistic missile. But the idea of Laserbeak Stealth is a good one with him being able to transform into different objects like he did in Dark of the Moon. And as Laserbeak moves through the facility, it gives us a look at the layout which turns out to be rather concerning. You see, it turns out this old Sector 7 facility has been transformed into the MechTech production facility, so it must be destroyed if the Decepticons are to eradicate the issue that is MechTech. And after scanning different computers and doors, Laserbeak arrives at the door controls, and having exposed all the cores to the tectonic stabilizers, Soundwave can set the volcano off and drown the island in lava, an idea he got from one of those transmissions he intercepted. Once inside, Soundwave deals with any resistance and deals with the first two tectonic stabilizers, and after dealing with an Autobot trap which fails miserably, Soundwave arrives at the final stabilizers, which quickly get destroyed, and as the lava is consuming the island, Soundwave finishes his mission by getting the data and covering up the moon landing. And all the info of Shockwave, he deletes it all and sends a copy to Megatron once he's escaped from instant death. Megatron, now equipped with this information, detects the Autobots are shipping the last shipment of MechTech to the Middle East, so Megatron deploys Starscream to deal with the situation. As Starscream moves through the valley towards the plane, he trips the valley's trap system because he's a blithering idiot. And after a short firefight, Air Raid arrives and Starscream engages in chase which ends up in a fight and then another chase which leads to the plane of interest. After chasing the plane for a short while and fending off air defences, we learn the plane itself is in fact a transformer because it engages its stellar force and deploys the aerial bots who quickly all perish from nat natural causes I prefer to call missiles. And after, un and after unlocking Starscream's lock-ons, I quickly send the plane crashing and burning. But before it does demise, Starscream loops the cargo passage for the last of the mech tech and takes two and leaves the rest to burn. Now this is the last mission of the game, and it's my favourite mission. Starscream arrives at Megatron's base and after finding out Starscream didn't deactivate the mech tech's tracking systems, he decides to kill him, which is pretty reasonable. And this is probably the best level of the game, you see Megatron is heavily damaged from his fight in the last movie, so with his replacement hand he's able to he is seen to have in Dark of the Moon. And because of the damage to many of his internal systems, they're still offline. So to help himself heal, he drains the energy on from others, which is what he does to Starscream. However, the Autobots attack due to the, the tracking system I mentioned before. Megatron needs Starscream to get back into the fight and sends him off to defend the base. But Megatron needs his weapon systems, which are still offline. So with some borrowed energy on and a bit of time, Soundwave manages to get the fusion cannon back online and opened the door. Moving through the Decepticon HQ, we are met with Ironhide and with his power of poorly loaded textures, sends Megatron to the pits of hell. Touch! The 
awakening in the basement of Megatron's base, he decides to weaponize the hatchlings by using plutonium, his task of stealing from the rockets. He begins to use the hatchlings to kill Autobots. Moving ahead, Megatron orders Soundwave to begin Shockwave's falling sequence early, as he cannot have him falling into Autobot hands. One issue, Megatron's damage. And he needs energy, so as we move towards the cryo bay, we drain as much energy from all of the Autobots as possible, arriving in the tunnels that lead to the cryo bay. Megatron scans a nearby truck and begins to move through the tunnels. He then comes across a boss fight against Warpath, who starts talking some shit and immediately dies like a loser. Honestly, Warpath, the human-driven tanks gave me more trouble. Arriving in the cryo bay, Megatron moves inside the cryo control room as Sandwave isn't able to remotely access them. So, as Megatron takes the first room offline, Megatron takes the first room offline, and the short shoot out in the second one takes that one offline too. And using the plutonium he collected earlier, he gives enough power to begin the firing sequence. It is, however, at this moment Optimus arrives and begins the most difficult boss fight in the entire game, with Optimus's chainsaw and flight tech and his energy sealed, which we need to deal with by freezing Prime to damage the shield. And then, after a few moments of rinse and repeat, Megatron sends Prime into the final mission of the game. Prime awakens in Shockwave's crowd bay. How Shockwave and his worm got there is beyond me, and Shockwave isn't even a scientist in this universe. Yes, Shockwave, the assassin. Optimus radios Ratchet to remotely activate the backup cryo systems, which works for all of two seconds. And Optimus spends a short while fighting the worm. But as the fight begins to drag on, Shockwave awakens and jumps into the ice arena. But if touched, will attempt to freeze you to death with a little effect. Shockwave, however, is too heavily armored, with the only vulnerable part of him being his back. So good luck getting back there, buddy. Once you beat Shockwave down a little, he jumps back on his ice platform and you've got to spend five whole minutes killing the worm. Which gives you time to think about the life decisions that brought you here. At least you have massive guns to do it. Once the room has thawed and the worm has been defeated, all of what reinforcements arrive and Shockwaves jump back in. Now with a bigger arena and moving targets for Shockwave to lock onto, it makes it easier for us to hit his back and once he's damaged enough he makes a getaway. And once the screen cuts to black, we are taken to Africa, where Megatron says some Megatron words, and then the game just ends? Now, this game is pretty forgettable. The reason is for that is because the game is pretty bad, and it does, however, outweigh this and this, but it's shadowed by its much more successful little brother. Thanks for watching. I wanted to tell you that the Gears video is coming out, but I'm not happy with the script. I have all the footage, but I just don't like the script, but next video will be a fall of Cybertron vid, and with me successfully wasting more of your time, till next time.